Dr. Nurab Patel, CMO of University Medical Center in New Orleans, and then Monty Wilson, who is the president of Christus St. Francis Cabrini Hospital in Alexandria. Uh, Governor Edwards will then provide closing comments and then open it up to questions. Please uh, be aware that we're not going to have a whole lot of time, and so we will only take questions from reporters with established media outlets only. And to the reporters, please provide your name and your media outlet affiliation in the chat box as soon as you know that you have a question so that I can go ahead and call on you at the appropriate time. So everyone listening, please make sure that your microphones are muted. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started and turn things over to Governor Edwards. Governor? Thank you, Shauna. And just to be sure, I want to make sure that you can hear me. Yes, sir, we can. Okay, very good. Well, I start the press conference today uh, saying something that I hoped I would not have to say again, and that is that we're surging again here in Louisiana, uh, particularly because of the Omicron uh, variant. Um, and quite frankly, uh, while it has been a very sharp increase over the last number of days, we're going to get into that in just a moment, um, we are still at the very beginning of this current surge, and that's why uh, we need everyone to take this seriously, uh, be prudent in what you do and, and in what you don't do. Uh, and obviously, nobody should panic. Uh, that, that's not helpful and it's not necessary. But we have to take this very uh, seriously. And I'm going to show you some numbers that may, many of you may have already seen, but they are very sobering. Uh, so here is the latest. Uh, today, the Department of Health is reporting 12,467 new cases and 762 hospitalizations. Uh, the hospitalizations, by the way, that's a 268% increase just since December the 17th. Um, in the 14 days, in 14 days, the number of people in our hospitals with COVID has increased at a startling fast rate. And I'll just go back, you know, for four day total uh, over Christmas, uh, we've reported 12,164 cases. And that, that really took my breath away we reported more than that uh, in today's uh, number alone. Among those on uh, in the hospitals, we have 32 on mechanical ventilators, uh, and we reporting two deaths today, uh, which brings the total number of deaths in Louisiana since the start of the pandemic uh, to 14,986, just shy of 15,000. I uh, do want to tell you that emergency department visits and hospitals all across the state of Louisiana that are related to COVID have more than doubled over the last week. Um, and uh, oh, at, as of December the 25th, 16.7% uh, of emergency department visits were related to COVID-19. Uh, the peak was 18.7% uh, during Delta. Uh, the Delta surge. And so we know that we are right back there. And in fact, in my conversations today uh, with medical directors uh, of our tier one hospitals all across the state of Louisiana, and I'm going to get more into this in just a moment, uh, we know that the visits to the emergency department over the last couple of days have increased beyond even the numbers uh, that I just gave you. So we, we know that we're having uh, emergency department visits related to COVID-like illnesses uh, at an all-time high in the greater New Orleans area and in Northwest Louisiana, and likely, uh, if not already, very, very soon in every hospital across the state. So that's why we need to be serious, and we need, we need to take this uh, surge uh, very seriously. Uh, as I mentioned earlier today, I had an opportunity uh, to visit by Zoom uh, with all of the tier one hospital uh, medical directors from across the state of Louisiana. Uh, I wanted to get a firsthand account of what they're seeing and experiencing. Um, and I will tell you, we, we just mentioned it, the emergency department visits have been the, the, the most they've experienced thus far in the pandemic. Um, and it is very important that people not go to the emergency room simply to be tested for uh, COVID. And you're going to be given more information by Teresa Sokol of the Department of Health in just a moment about what you should do instead of going to the hospital. Uh, we do know that being vaccinated and boosted is a big differentiator between the severity of the disease that you can expect should you contract COVID. 
uh, right now. Uh, and obviously there is a continuum here, but the most severe disease is among unvaccinated people. The least severe disease is among those uh, who are vaccinated and boosted. And quite frankly, the boosters, that third shot, uh, make a tremendous difference. Uh, that's a big differentiator right now. Uh, and then the last thing I wanna share with you, although we, we covered a number of topics with the hospitals across the state, the last thing I wanna share with you is about hospital capacity. It's certainly becoming an issue, both with respect to the overall census. And I mentioned to you a while ago, how many people in the hospital today uh, diagnosed as, as COVID uh, positive. Uh, but really the more limiting factor at the moment, at least, has to do with staffing availability uh, because a very large number and percentage of the hospital's doctors, therapists, and others who are involved in direct patient care uh, are out. They're not available because they too uh, have COVID that's caused by this Omicron variant, which as you all know, is extremely transmissible. Um, and it's, it's on an order of transmissibility that's several times higher than any of the variants that we have experienced uh, thus far. Uh, and, and I'll let Dr., uh, uh, I should say, Teresa Sokol explain in a minute about whether it is or isn't more virulent. We, we don't believe that it is, uh, but it's just a function of math uh, that if, if uh, many, many more people contract COVID because of its enhanced transmissibility, it can be less violent and still uh, put a real strain on our uh, hospital capacity. Uh, I also, and I mentioned this earlier, I spoke to some hospital leaders today, but I want you to hear from some directly. I want you to, to get a, a firsthand account of what they're experiencing and what their observations are, uh, and they will share that with you uh, shortly. You know, I, I told you that uh, today we added 12,467 cases. Uh, yesterday, we, we added 9,378, uh, and according to the CDC and the New York Times and, and others, that was the most we've ever added in, in a 24-hour period, and now we've actually broken that by about a, a third um, higher. Uh, and so if you go all the way back to the start of the pandemic, we have not reported numbers uh, this high in terms of cases, and so I want that to sink in with the people all across Louisiana, just what this disease burden is like across uh, our state. And then understand that we are at the beginning of this surge. We're not at the middle of it. We're certainly not at the end of it. Uh, and, and so this is a very challenging situation that we need to take seriously. Uh, we also know that the numbers that we're reporting in terms of cases don't include people who are taking at-home antigen tests uh, because those positive test results are not being included uh, in these numbers. And secondly, we know that there are a lot of people out there who, even though they're infected and infectious, they have COVID, they're asymptomatic, and people who are asymptomatic typically are not being tested at all. Uh, and, and in fact, recent CDC estimates uh, indicate that for every case that is reported, there are additional three individuals who are infected, uh, but those infections are not being reported. Uh, now, this is playing out in a lot of ways, one of which is increasing uh, percent positivity, meaning the percentage of tests that we're administering on a daily basis. Uh, you know, what, what, what is the percentage of those tests that are yielding positive results? Uh, what we can tell you is one week statewide percent positivity and in incidents both increased by more than 200% from the previous weekly report. Um, very preliminary data for the week uh, that ended December the 23rd indicates the percent positivity to report it next week will be more than two times uh, this week's 10.7%. So we're going to have a percent positivity uh, that will be well in excess of 20% uh, the next time we officially report. And what that means is statewide, more than 20% of all of our tests that we're administering are yielding a positive result. Average daily incidence of COVID-1 in Region 1, um, and that's the greater New Orleans area, has actually exceeded uh, the Delta surge peak. And in fact, when you look at disease burden and transmission across the state, 95% of our 64 parishes are at the two highest levels of community transmission. 
That's up 81% uh, of parishes uh, who were in this uh, category last week. Uh, these alarming increases are due to the continued rapid spread of the Omicron variant. Uh, it obviously, uh, and I don't think this is questioned by anyone anymore, it spreads much faster than other variants that we've experienced to date. Now it is the dominant strain across Louisiana and responsible for more than 90% of all COVID cases. Uh, so not unlike when a storm is barreling to us, toward us and we see it coming across the Gulf or, or the Atlantic, you know, when we experience a surge, and we've already been here four times previously, uh, we have to take additional precautions to stay safe, to ride it out, to minimize loss. And we know that at some point, and we don't know when, uh, we're going to crest and we're going to start coming down again. Uh, but we have to make sure that we don't overwhelm our capacity to deliver life-saving care, not just to COVID patients, but to anyone uh, who needs care in our hospitals. They could be stroke victims, heart attack victims, motor vehicle accidents, you name it. Uh, we need to make sure that we have the capacity there uh, to render uh, that care uh, that they need. Um, it is also true that the vast majority of people who are currently hospitalized with COVID-19 are not fully vaccinated. Uh, and LDH put out guidance earlier this week recommending uh, getting vaccinated and being boosted. That booster shot is incredibly important, but also masking indoors in public uh, places, masking uh, indoors when you're with members who are not of your own household, um, you know, and, and then masking outside when distancing is not possible, uh, working remotely when that's feasible and limiting your exposures uh, to those who are not in your household. All of these things are important. They go back to the beginning really uh, of COVID, uh, but they remain uh, very integral parts of the way that we combat this surge. Um, and, and even since LDH, put out that information, the situation has obviously deteriorated uh, further. Uh, so I wanted to get in front of the media, in front of the people in Louisiana today, one day before Christmas Eve, uh, when I know many people like to get together, uh, have a party, have a, have a family gathering and so forth. Um, but the Department of Health here in Louisiana and I are urging you to celebrate from home with members of your everyday household. Uh, because that's how much COVID-19 there is out there right now and how highly transmissible it is and how serious the situation is. That's why I will be ringing in the new year from here where I am currently at my home in, in Roseland. Um, and quite frankly, uh, we changed our plans for Christmas as well. Uh, so rather than having extended family members coming in, some from out of state and so forth, uh, we celebrated Christmas just as our nuclear uh, household uh, with, with my wife and, and, and children. And we're going to do that throughout the week here um, in Roseland. And, and then we'll do it uh, for New Year's Eve and New Year's Day as well. And I'm, I'm encouraging everyone uh, to consider this and to do it and, and to make sure that you're as safe as you can be this weekend. Uh, and it's not just the new year. We know that, that uh, a few days after uh, New Year's Day, uh, K through 12 schools are going to resume, uh, and and it's going to resume while we are in a surge like we haven't yet experienced in terms of the disease burden, the amount of cases that are out there, and and all of the transmission uh, that's occurring, and all of the implications that that has for the safety of our children, our teachers, and other staff, and and families, and so forth. Um, so you're going to hear Teresa Sokol in a minute put out new strong recommendations. Uh, for a safe return to K through 12 uh, schools. Uh, but these recommendations uh, will include uh, urging schools to ensure that we have universal masking indoors and outdoors when distancing isn't possible. Uh, we need you to look at suspending extracurricular activities uh, so long as the uh, extremely transmissible Omicron variant is circulating at such high levels uh, throughout our state. Um, and we should never, ever uh, lose sight of just how important vaccinations uh, and, and boosters are. Uh, current vaccines do protect against severe illness, hospitalizations, and death due to infection with the Omicron variant. Uh, however, we know that there are going to be some breakthrough infections, and we, we've had those. Um, and I would remind everyone that when the vaccines were developed, 
uh, they were designed and, and the purpose was to provide protection against severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Uh, they still do that. Uh, but we know the protection that they give you does wane over time, which is why it's important that, that people get bo boosted uh, when they're eligible uh, for a booster. And that booster and my conversations with the hospitals today, uh, they really spoke about how uh, much protection that was affording people um, because they're just not seeing uh, many severe cases at all of, of uh, COVID uh, requiring inpatient hospitalization for those people who have uh, been uh, fully vaccinated and then boosted. Uh, now, I'm going to also address myself to unvaccinated folks. And, you know, we've been uh, administering vaccines in Louisiana for 12 and a half months now. Uh, and clearly there are people, many people, too many people who, for whatever reason, uh, have decided not to avail themselves of the benefits of the protection that's afforded by, by vaccines. Um, but I'm going to continue to talk to them um, because it's important. It's important for them, for their family, uh, for their community, and, and for the state. Um, and I don't believe that any choices that have been made, any decisions have been made, uh, are necessarily permanent, especially when we know that facts change. Um, and so when we're looking at a, a surge uh, in cases and in transmission that exceeds anything we've experienced to date, uh, that's certainly something that needs to be taken into consideration by anyone who hasn't yet uh, been vaccinated. It needs to be taken into consideration by anyone who's been vaccinated but not boosted. Uh, and, and so we're going to continue to talk uh, to all of these individuals, and we're going to do everything we can to remove obstacles uh, that may be out there uh, and making it harder for people to uh, be vaccinated. Uh, you know, we've worked very hard to stock it across the state, uh, make it convenient, uh, it's free, uh, and, and so forth. And we've been doing that uh, since the early days in the pandemic. We make sure that it's available for people off hours. So, so it doesn't have to interfere with work or other obligations. Um, but we also know that bad information, misinformation um, are also obstacles. And we're trying to remove that for people as well, which is why we have people uh, who speak to you like Teresa Sokol, uh, like Dr. O'Neill, Dr. Patel, and, and Monty Wilson. But we also ask you if, if for whatever reason, if this isn't sufficient for you to feel comfortable uh, and get vaccinated, uh, talk to your healthcare provider. Talk to someone that, that you rely upon. Um, by the way, we have reason to believe that our efforts are working, not to the degree that we would like, uh, but since the month of December, an additional almost 72,000 people have received their first shot. Uh, and every new year brings about a host of resolutions that people make about things that they're gonna do or not do uh, for their benefit or the benefit of their families. And so for those people who have not yet been vaccinated, uh, I would encourage you to add uh, being vaccinated to your list of New Year's resolutions uh, and do it uh, in a way that you're going to keep it because a, a lot of New Year's resolutions, as you know, are, are not necessarily kept. But this will be the most important one that you can make uh, for 2022. Um, and while I hope and pray that 2022 is a much better year for each of you individually, for our families, for our state, for our country, uh, January is going to be very, very challenging. Uh, and there's just no doubt about that uh, right now. Uh, it's going to be challenging on individual, uh, who, individuals who contract COVID uh, or who have family members, but for professionals, whether it's our teachers, whether it's our doctors, our nurses, our therapists, you name it, this is going to be a very challenging year. So I'm asking everyone to take this seriously and do what you can. Uh, to help us navigate through what is going to be a very difficult uh, several weeks, at least through the month of January. Uh, so with that, I'm going to ask uh, state epidemiologist Teresa Sokol to share some information with you, and then you're going to hear from Dr. O'Neill, Dr. Patel, and Monty Wilson, and then I'll come back and, and uh, take some questions at the conclusion of their remarks. I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you very much, Governor Edwards. Uh, I'm Teresa Sobel. I'm the state epidemiologist with the Louisiana Department of Health. And I'm going to be reviewing data related to our Omicron surge and go over some 
public health recommendations, some enhanced public health recommendations, um, given the level of transmission that's occurring in our state. Uh, and Dr. Cantor usually presents this information. He's taking some well-earned leave, and so I've got some big shoes to fill. Um, one of the recommendations that I'm going to be making is to stay home and work remotely as much as possible. Um, you can see that I happen to be in my office, and this really is for two reasons. One, almost all the rest of my team works remotely. And number two, my 10-year-old son would really very much like to have the opportunity to speak with Governor Edwards. And so I thought it was best for all parties involved that I actually take this call from the office. So let me just try to share my screen. Okay. I think we've already covered this one. All right. So I think everyone is familiar with our um, community risk visualization. This is the front page of our dashboard. For those of you who may not know, community risk is a classification system. It's meant to allow community members and policymakers to really understand the COVID-19 risk status, status in each parish. And the hope that that information will help guide appropriate health behavior. Um, this system is based on CDC, uh, it's just a classification system developed by CDC, and we determine each parish's risk according to two factors that evaluate transmission. One is one-week incidence, which is the number of new cases per 100,000 population, and the other is percent positivity, which I think everybody knows is the percent of tests for COVID-19 that are positive. Um, <clears throat> just to refresh everyone's memory, we have four categories. High and substantial are two highest categories, and you can see here that 95% of our parishes are at the highest COVID-19 risk levels. 49 of our 64 parishes are at the high level of transmission. This is where you have either at least 10% positivity or more than 100 cases per 100,000 population. And what that means is that in these areas, there is widespread uncontrolled COVID transmission with many undetected cases. That is where most of our state was as of the time these data were reported, and there is a lag with these data. Um, so I can tell you that probably right now, the entire state, every single parish, um, because of the level of transmission that's occurring, the number of new cases that we're seeing every single day, I think every single parish is in that category at this point. So I'm going to go over the gating, uh, statewide gating slide. Um, this is something that I know that Dr. Cantor um, often presents to just give everybody good visibility across all of the indicators that we really track. So if you look at the top left-hand side, what we're tracking here are, um, you'll hear us refer to it as CLI, and it's the percent of emergency department visits that are attributable to people presenting with COVID-like symptoms. You can see, of course, our distinct surges here. What I'd really like everybody to pay attention to is where we are right now. The steep, steep increase in emergency department visits related to COVID-like illness. As Governor Edwards mentioned, we're at 16.7% right now of all emergency department visits related to people presenting with COVID-like symptoms. That's up from 7.4% just a week ago. And you can see we're almost at the peak with Delta. And what this means for emergency departments is that they are very strained um, and that they need to be able to maintain the capacity to provide services for people who need emergency care. So I'm gonna talk a little bit later about COVID testing, but I just wanna briefly mention here that it's very important for people who wanna be tested and if they don't have symptoms, or they have very mild symptoms and they know the emergency department has to be open, that's not the place to go to get a COVID test. I'm gonna provide some additional advice later on, but I just wanted to illustrate how, um, how many emergency department visits they're seeing overall and that we really need to preserve the capacity for our emergency room. So I'm gonna move on to the um, top right-hand side. This is our epi curve. I know everyone's familiar with it. It graphs. Um, average daily incidence based on the date a specimen was collected over time. Now, I will say this. Um, there is a delay again. I believe that this last data point right here 
um, is maybe December 23rd. Um, you can see already, even though there's a lag, you see a sharp increase is occurring. But what I can tell you is that if you were to rerun these data with the more recent um, cases that we've seen over the past couple of days, it would be much, much deeper. So just keep that in mind. This is to show we're definitely surging. We're surging even higher than you can see us the, um, based on this epi curve. Moving on to the bottom left-hand corner here. And what you can see is that um, you see the purple line is um, percent positive. I'm sorry, the purple line is test volume. It's the number of tests per 10,000 um, residents and the orange bars are percent positivity. The percent positivity that was reported this week um, is there's a lag of maybe five or six days, and it was 10.7%, which is already more than triple the previous week of 3.3%. But as, as Governor Edwards said, we have pulled some preliminary data to see what's happening most recently, and we think that probably we're going to land somewhere between 20 and 30 percent for next week. And you can see we have not seen in any of the previous surges, we have not seen um, levels that high since the very first surge when we had almost no testing available. And we're not in that situation right now. The issue with the increases in percent positivity is not because of limited capacity with testing, it's because of dramatically increased transmission. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about hospitalizations. Um, so basically what we know is that hospitalizations are increasing statewide, um, not as quickly as cases, but we also know that hospitalizations, tra increases in hospitalizations trail increases in cases by approximately one to two weeks. Um, now, as Governor Edwards mentioned, there are some reports that Omicron may result in less severe illness, and I'll be happy for Dr. O'Neill to talk a little bit more about what she's seeing in the hospital setting. Um, but even if a smaller proportion of cases require hospitalization with Omicron, which we really don't know yet, um, we know that a smaller proportion of the enormous number of cases that are occurring may overwhelm our facilities. Um, we have not seen the number of cases that are occurring right now ever before in the pandemic. And so we need to keep that in mind when we're thinking about the need to preserve hospital capacity. Um, <clears throat> as Governor Edwards mentioned, what we have heard and what we've seen, what we've collected in our data, that most individuals who are hospitalized still are unvaccinated and that the more well vaccinated you are, the better protected you're going to be for severe disease. So we strongly encourage folks to get boosted as soon as they're eligible. I did want to briefly touch on um, therapeutics at this point because we, pre in previous surges, particularly with the Delta surge, um, we had monoclonal antibodies that were in plentiful supply. These could be administered to people who were at high risk for progression to hospitalization and severe disease, and it would help, did a good job of helping to prevent that progression to severe illness. We're in a very different situation now. There were three um, types of monoclonal, monoclonal antibodies that were previously available. And unfortunately, the two that were in the most plentiful supply um, are, do not appear to be effective against Omicron. And in fact, because of that, and because of the proportion of Omicron that's circulating throughout the United States, um, the federal government plans to put a pause on distribution of these two monoclonal antibodies beginning um, next year, beginning of January. Um, that leaves one monoclonal antibody, citrovimab, that remains effective against the Omicron variant. The problem with, with citrovimab is that it is in very limited supply. We have very few doses here in Louisiana. Um, we are certainly, as soon as we are allocated any doses from the federal government, we are pushing them out immediately to healthcare facilities so that they can get to patients that need them most. There just aren't enough to go around. So we don't have that option to help prevent hospitalization among the people who really may um, end up with severe illness. You've probably also heard um, about the uh, new pills that are being produced, the antiviral pills that are being produced um, by Merck and by Pfizer, and um, we are receiving allocations of those. But again, 
very limited supply. There are not enough to go around to all of the individuals who qualify as high risk and would benefit from some of these new therapeutics. So we're in a position now, which is different than with Delta, where we don't have enough of the therapeutics that may help prevent severe illness that we previously did. So I just think that that's important to, when we're thinking about the increases that we're already seeing in hospitalizations, because what it means is that the other measures for um, preventing transmission become even more important. One other thing I did want to mention about incidents, which I don't think I touched on, is re related to the increase. Um, right now, when we look at, if you look at community risk, we look at one-week incidents. This is average daily incidents that you see here. Um, currently, our one-week incidence is 287 per 100,000. And remember I said that the threshold for considering high levels of transmission is 100 per 100,000. What we will be reporting out next week based on our preliminary data analysis is more than 750 per 100,000, up from 287 just one week before. And for context, I can tell you at the beginning of December, that number was only 49 per 100,000. So in a month, we've gone from 49 per 100,000 to over 750 per 100,000. That shows you how quickly this variant spreads. Okay, I'm gonna show a couple of slides. Um, I know you all are familiar with these gating tables. This goes back to the White House criteria that were established that we continue to monitor. And what the indicators that are evaluated with this are the emergency department visits related to COVID-like illness, um, the new cases that are occurring, and also hospitalization. The last time we reviewed this with everybody um, was October 20th, and you can see that, um, that we were doing really well. Um, everything is green, which is decreasing. We have a few yellow indicators. That means plateau or everything's stable. We had one indicator that was decreasing in one of our regions. And other than that, we were, we were really in, um, doing really well. This is where we are now. We're increasing across the state and all of the regions across all of these indicators, with the exception of hospitalizations in Region 5, where right now what we're seeing is a plateau. I don't expect it's going to stay that way for long, though. So I do want to touch a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of different age groups. Um, what you can see here, the gray line is um, 18 to 29 year olds. And you can see that, and this is not unlike previous surges, we started to see the increase um, related to Omicron first in this young adult population. And it continues, the young adult cases among the this young adult population continue to account for most of our cases. Um, probably where, where, where that started was related to some large university outbreaks that we had when Omicron was first introduced into our state. And then transmission subsequently continued in that population and certainly then spread to other age groups as well. Um, after the, the group where we're seeing the second highest uh, number of cases are the 30 to 39 year olds, followed by our kids under the age of 18. Um, and so, as Governor Edwards mentioned, we are increasingly concerned because there are a very large number of cases among our pediatric population right now, and we really want to make sure that we can um, ensure the safety of the in-person learning experience. So we're working very hard to achieve that. I'm just going to briefly touch on this slide. I think everyone's familiar with it. This graphs the new nursing home resident and staff cases and deaths by week. And what I really want to highlight here is, um, is related to the effects of the vaccine. So what we know is that um, the nursing home residents are, are very well vaccinated. I think about 90% are fully vaccinated. And we have another, I think, uh, a little over 50% that are boosted as well. The nursing home staff, um, are not as well vaccinated. We have oh, about, um, they're, they're doing much, much better. We have um, about 80% that, that are vaccinated, at least have one vaccine, but only 13% of these individuals have been boosted. And so you can really see that when you're looking at the recent increases in cases. The gray line here is, represents new cases among nursing home staff members. And again, 
They are not very, very few of these individuals are boosted. So you see that there's a sharp increase in, um, in the number of new cases in that population recently. We do see a little bit of an uptick here in the blue line of new resident cases, but it's much, it's much less steep than what we're seeing with the new, um, the new cases among nursing home staff. And right now, unfortunately, I'm worried that we're gonna potentially start to see some changes, but right now um, we're still seeing fairly stable um, numbers of deaths, which is showing us that the vaccine is well protective against those severe health outcomes, um, the hospitalizations and deaths. I'm hoping that trend continues. I think everyone is probably familiar with um, the proportions of Omicron that are circulating. I just wanted to show this slide to show how dramatic the increase has been from one week to the next. Here, the week ending uh, December 4th, we had less than 5%. The proportion of Omicron among other circulating lineages was less than 5%. The following week, it was, um, looks like less than 50%, and now it is um, over 80%. It represents over 80% of, um, of our circulating lineages. So I think that because what we know about Omicron being so highly transmissible, the more growth advantage it has and the more it becomes our dominant circulating strain, the greater the risk for increased transmission is gonna be. So now I wanna just move quickly on to um, what does all of this mean? What should we do? I agree 100% with Governor Edwards. Now is not the time to panic. Now is the time to act because we know now how to control it. We know what to do. We know what actions to take. We just need to take them. So I'm gonna remind everybody what the most important um, actions we can take are. First and foremost, we all have to talk about being vaccinated and boosted. This is gonna protect people against severe illness. And especially if folks get boosted, this is gonna protect against infection and help reduce subsequent transmission. Um, vaccination is really how we put this pandemic behind us. We say it all the time, but it's true. And so we, we strongly encourage people who haven't already uh, to choose to get vaccinated and boosted. Now, what we know in order to really immediately reduce transmission, there are some other actions that we can take. We need to stay home as much as possible. We need to work remotely. We need to limit our interactions with people who are not in our everyday household. Um, and that means no social gatherings like on New Year's Eve. Similar to Governor Edwards, my family will be staying at home. I'm gonna let my kids stay up till midnight. They'll, I'll probably fall asleep before they do, which is gonna be a mistake because my son also got a box, a box of pranks for Christmas. So no telling what's gonna happen, but there's gonna be some excitement that can be had. So. Um, so it'll, we, can, we can make it fun and we're all looking forward to it. Um, everyone needs to mask. I can't emphasize this enough. We know that masks work. We know that they work no matter what variant is circulating. Everybody needs to mask indoors and people need to mask outdoors if you're gonna be in a crowded setting, if you're gonna be not gonna be able to physically distance. I do wanna talk a little bit about testing because testing is another strategy that we have. Testing allows for early detection and then isolation of those cases to prevent transmission and quarantine of people who are close contact so that they don't transmit the virus if they become positive. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about what the testing situation is right now. Right now, we have PCR tests that are still widely available. Um, right now, the turnaround time is 24 to 48 hours in most cases. But we also know that as the demand for testing increases, that may change. Um, the turnaround time may be longer. Um, they may become less widely available. We are already seeing shortages with regard to rapid tests, both the types of tests that you can go to a healthcare setting and be tested, and also the over-the-counter tests that you might just buy in the drugstore. Um, there are shortages here and shortages nationwide. Um, while we could do continue to try to make testing widely available because it is important, and if you want to find, try to find a testing site that's near you, you can go to ldh.la.gov slash COVID testing, 
or you can call 211 to find a site near you. But if you are asymptomatic, but you know you've been exposed, or you have very mild symptoms, and you're not able to find a, a testing location for some reason, the important thing to do, given our level of transmission, is to really go ahead and take precautions. If you have been exposed, but you're not able to be tested to find out if you've been infected, go ahead and quarantine um, to keep everybody safe. CDC put out new guidelines that actually make it easier to quarantine and to isolate. So if you are fully vaccinated and, um, and if you're fully vaccinated, if you're boosted or you are fully vaccinated and not yet eligible for a booster dose, then you actually don't need to quarantine at home. You can wear a, make sure you wear a mask for 10 days. Um, and then if you can, try to test yourself at day five. Um, but, but that's the, the new CDC recommendation for quarantine. If you are not fully vaccinated or you are unvaccinated, we are asking that you quarantine at home for five days. And then for the next five days, the remainder of the quarantine, you don't have to stay at home anymore, but you do need to wear a mask to protect others in case you, you might still be infectious. So that makes it much easier than the 14-day quarantine period that was recommended before. If you are symptomatic and you're not able to get tested, if you have COVID-like symptoms, at this point, given what we're seeing here, you need to assume that you have COVID and you need to act accordingly. Again, isolation guidance has changed as well. And this is true across the board, regardless of whether or not you are, uh, regardless of vaccination status. Everyone who's infected or suspects that they are infected should isolate, stay at home, for five days, and then after five days, if your symptoms have resolved, you don't have any fever, um, then you can go, or you're, at least your symptoms are mostly improving, but you can't have fever, then you can leave your home, but you really need to wear the mask for the additional five days of that traditional 10-day isolation period. So that would be my recommendation if you're not able to get tested. And again, the new guidance makes it a little bit easier to do that. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate, please do not go to an emergency department to get a COVID test if you are asymptomatic or you have mild symptoms that can be managed at home. We need to preserve that capacity for emergency care. So the last thing I'm going to talk about are the return to school recommendations. Um, so, as Governor Edwards said, um, you know, we know that, um, we know that, school, that schools are going to be reopening next week. We also know that many children have probably traveled or have gathered with members outside of their household, which puts them at increased risk for infection. And we also know that Omicron spreads very easily and very quickly. Um, you can, you've seen the sharp increase in COVID cases that's resulted in also sharp increases in hospitalizations and emergency department visits. And I can tell you that this variant is capable of causing widespread outbreaks in schools and will likely result in K through 12 school closures um, because of a large number of absences if prevention measures are not strictly followed in these settings. So here's what needs to happen in order to keep kids and, and people who and adults who work in schools safe and keep those um, schools open. Mask universally indoors and outside when social distancing isn't possible. This has to be done across the board um, for everyone except for whom it might be contraindicated, um, someone with a, with a disability, for example, who can't tolerate it. But everybody else really needs to mask universally inside the, the K-12 setting. One of the areas where we've previously seen outbreaks has been during mealtime because out of necessity, you have to take your mask off, right? So, um, so what we need to do in those situations is try to increase the distance because kids will not be masked. We need to try to keep them at least six feet apart as, as much as possible. Now, here's a recommendation. Governor Edwards mentioned it. It's not something we've recommended across the board before, but this just goes to show everybody um, the the level of transmission that's occurring and the concern we have um, for what might happen in schools when they reopen. What is safest is to suspend extracurricular activities
activities right now. This is where most of the outbreaks that we have identified in K through 12 settings have occurred, is been associated with extracurricular activities. We want to preserve in-person learning. We think these need to be suspended. Now, we, we don't want it to just sort of remain in depth, an indefinite recommendation. We think that once statewide incidence is below 200 infections per 100,000 people, they can perhaps safely resume. Remember, that is still double what we consider to be high levels of transmission, but when we are having cases on the order of 750 per 100,000, it's just not safe. So we recommend, our public health recommendation is to suspend these extracurricular activities and other social gatherings um, like uh, pep rallies or, um, uh, or school dances, that sort of thing. Um, get vaccinated and boosted, kids and staff both when they're eligible, and we would like, if possible, for the children and staff to be tested prior to return to school, so that simply if someone is positive but they don't know it, then they can isolate before they come to school. Um, again, I know that some of these recommendations are difficult to implement. I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old son, and um, maintaining the safety of these environments is near and dear to my heart both personally and professionally, um, but this is really what needs to happen right now. We will closely monitor the situation and then um, lift some of the more enhanced control measures um, as appropriate. I think that is the last slide I have, so and it sounds like we're holding questions until the end, so I will toss it to um, Dr. Catherine O'Neill. Thank you, Teresa. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you both for allowing me to be on today to talk a little bit about what's going on in the hospital and then um, next steps to, um, to hopefully try to get out of the surge as quickly as possible. I, um, I looked at our hospital census this morning. It, it's shocking. It's shocking each surge. You don't get used to seeing an exponential growth of patients in the hospital with one disease, which we've talked about before. We've tripled our census since last week. Uh, our ER is inundated and has been for several days now. By inundated, what I mean is that it feels like you might as well leave the doors wide open because you can't stop the flow of patients that need to be cared for. And um, that feeling felt um, like an apocalypse two years ago. And now we know that it's a surge and, um, and it's here and we are gonna buckle down in the hospital and do our best again. When you look at these 66 patients that are with us today, uh, there are some similarities and there are some differences. The similarities are that the sickest people are unvaccinated, again. And when you look at those sickest people, it is shocking to see who has chosen to remain unvaccinated and, the, and speaks to our failure as a community to really get the knowledge needed to everybody who needs it, uh, whether it's a grandmother who has been struggling at home for a week and refused to come in and is now on life support, or whether it's a father who's relatively healthy but cannot handle this disease, how, how have they not reached for a vaccine yet? And how can we do a better job of, of getting that vaccine to those people? We also have vaccinated and unboosted people in the hospital. And as we spoke about in the Delta surge, those people are more typically people who have lots of underlying illnesses. They are fragile. They're the people we wrap our hands around as a community and try to protect because we know that vaccines alone do not protect them. And now we know that they have to have boosters as well. They have to have that third dose because this is a three dose series. And if they don't have that third dose, they're susceptible. So we are seeing those people in the hospital as well. And we need to get our boosters into as many people as possible in the next couple of weeks. We also have 10 children in the children's hospital. And I will tell you, we talked about this in the Delta surge when it first began. We knew we would see more kids, but this is the fastest increase in children that we've seen at the beginning of a surge. Most of these children are also unvaccinated. In fact, they are uniformly unvaccinated because we have really not reached our pediatric population, even though we've had vaccines accessible to them for months. And absolutely every child who qualifies for a vaccine could be fully vaccinated by today. And so because of that, we have got to get that knowledge out. We're starting school, many of these kids are fairly healthy. Many of these children are also under the age of five and they have school age children in their home. And we know that the only way to protect the babies in our house who can't be vaccinated is to protect the parents by vaccinating them and to protect the siblings by vaccinating them. So we have some work to do. And that work doesn't start in the hospital. 
it starts in the community. I am at, um, I'm at Savoy Memorial today, so I'm not in Baton Rouge. My family decided to get together for an atypical Christmas New Year's in the hot Louisiana December sun and eat outside today and try to see each other. I'm not as, um, as great of a celebration as we would have wanted much better than last year uh, when we were unvaccinated. And um, so we'll sit outside and, and eat the stew that I already smelled before I came over here uh, to get better internet. And it's gonna be a great afternoon. But as I drove here, and I've talked to you before about how much I love this drive um, to get home, I, uh, I thought about how, how are we here? How do, how do we get here again? Why are we in another surge? And, um, and why do we have so many sick people? And I thought about uh, the doctor who trained me. So Dr. Wayne LaHaye, who walked this hall for just a tremendous number of years, uh, delivered me. He delivered my siblings, took out our tonsils, uh, held our family members' hands as they passed, and taught me a ton of life lessons. But the biggest one he taught me is, um, is how to use generational education. He would visit with a person for minutes, uh, take a look at them, write a few sentences in the chart, and totally know what was wrong. And after watching him for weeks and rounding with him for weeks, I asked him one day, how do, you, how do you know? It doesn't take you long to figure out that a patient's having a heart attack. This patient said that bananas irritated them and you know that they were having an MI. And he said, oh, I've known these people all their lives. I know what they complain about. I know what medicines they're on. And um, I, I know what they're gonna come in with. He wasn't, a, he wasn't mystic. He took decades of knowledge and he knew his people. And he got us through a ton of illnesses in this small town. And, um, and he is retired and we are poor for that. Uh, but as I think about coming home and I think about the lessons he taught me, I think about the people here. We use generational knowledge every day. My dad um, and I had a conversation months ago at the end of the Delta surge. I told him that I'd finally gotten a chance to bush hog my front pasture, which was way overgrown. And he said, um, did you pop the hood of your tractor and clean out the filter inside? I didn't know there was a filter under the hood of my tractor. I cleaned the outside. So I went to the barn and I cleaned it out. Thank goodness, or I probably would have ruined my tractor. That's a generational knowledge. That's, I don't learn that in school. It gets passed down, but it gets passed down and we survive because of it. And that's how we survive as a community. I am blocks away from the health department where I got every single vaccine when I was growing up. That vaccine schedule was not decided by my parents. It was decided by the public health department. People like Dr. Sokol, who just spoke to you. It was decided by a group of people who knew that they had seen pandemics just like this, and they weren't going to see them again. And my parents drove us there without any hesitation because they were not going to watch children on ventilators like they had seen during polio. It is a community effort to end the pandemic. It is not the hospital's effort. We come to you today to talk about the sick people, but that's the end. That's the failure of the community effort to end the pandemic. How do we get through this? And how do we not be here again this summer after everybody goes on summer vacation? Because that's the next surge. How do we end this current surge so that we can go to school? Uh, my kids are looking forward to some regular springtime activities. So I know you are too. We entered this pandemic with generational knowledge and we're not using it. When I went to fellowship, there was no pandemic happening, but I learned that vaccination, testing, and mitigation got you out of a pandemic. I learned that because people long before I went to medical school were writing books about how to get out of pandemics. This is not new. We have got to vaccinate. We have got to test. If we're sick and if we're going somewhere this weekend, and we need to mitigate, which means masking and slowing down to get out of the surge. It's the three things. It's the three things for two years, and we can do it. We just have to commit. And it's not committing to the people on this call today. And it's not committing to the hospital. We're going to be there at the end. And we'll hold people's hands. We'll hopefully get some better. And we will ease some people out of their life. But that is a failure of our community to commit to the same generational knowledge that gets my tractor going the next time I get on it, um, hopefully sooner than later, because the grass is still growing. That gets physicians to be the kind of physician you want to see. Um, and gets us through as a community. So what we're asking today, what the hospitals are asking to help, but mostly I think what we're all asking each other, um, just to ease ourselves into 2022 and hopefully have a much better year, is 
use the things that have been given to us. Use that generational knowledge. Get vaccinated. Go get your booster if you haven't yet. Please slow down this weekend. Let's mitigate ourselves out of this surge and get tested if you feel sick today so that we can try to take care of you. Thank you for letting me speak today. I really appreciate it. I'm gonna pass it off to the next speaker. Thanks, Dr. Neil. Hopefully you all can hear me. And thanks Governor Edwards for having us have this opportunity today. And many thanks to my esteemed colleagues across the, uh, the healthcare continuum who've been fighting this multi-pronged war against COVID for months now. Um, the Omicron variant is here and it's demonstrated a rapid ability to spread throughout the state. Um, here in New Orleans, uh, it spread faster than any of the other COVID variants. Our test positivity rates have jumped up from the single digits uh, to above the 25% mark uh, just in the last uh, week. Um, furthermore, we've seen a dramatic increase in the number of patients seen in the emergency room uh, with COVID-like illness. As uh, Dr. Sokol uh, demonstrated in her charts, we've seen the same numbers, 60% uh, of our ED visits are COVID-like illness right now. We've also seen a, a rapid uptick in the number of patients admitted with COVID just like uh, have been seen across the state. Um, and luckily these uh, patients seem a little bit less sick uh, than in the prior waves, but it's still early, uh, very early. And it usually takes about two weeks after the uh, start of the surge uh, to see the most critically ill patients. And so we're still not there yet. Um, and, uh, and hopefully we don't reach that state, but we're, we're still unknown. It is notable that about 77% of our patients, uh, our inpatients are unvaccinated. Uh, and that the burden, uh, as noted uh, by Dr. O'Neill, in children is still high. We have 13 patients hospitalized at Children's Hospital of New Orleans uh, with COVID disease. And so that's dramatic uh, for those kids uh, and, and their lives. One of the most challenging aspects of this Omicron uh, variant wave has been its effect on healthcare workers and their staffing. Um, we've had a large number of our uh, team members who've been affected, uh, either they're themselves or their families, uh, or their loved ones, and that's that's challenging um, and going on to two years in this pandemic. Um, luckily, we've been able to mitigate and, and continue uh, delivery of our COVID and non-COVID care, um, and the new CDC guidelines help us uh, do some of that, so that's important. But it's also important that, uh, as Governor Edwards noted, uh, patients uh, are at risk, and we want to make sure that we are, are remaining uh, able to con continue our care for the community for again, COVID disease as well as non-COVID disease. So what can you do? Um, and I think this is very important, uh, vaccinate, vaccinate and get boosted. There were two research briefs just published yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, that demonstrated the tremendous benefit of vaccination. Uh, a team in, in South Africa evaluated 130,000 uh, PCR, test PCR tested patients uh, and about 78,000 uh, patients in the, in the Omicron wave that they experienced. Um, and they found that just even two doses of the Pfizer vaccine was about 70% effective at preventing hospitalization. And this is in real world data. Um, in uh, another article in the same journal, um, a, an Israeli team identified that three do doses of the Pfizer vaccine was uh, uh, generating um, a neutralization titers that was well within the protective range against Omicron. And so um, it may not mean that you don't get infected, but you can still be very protected against being hospitalized, being, di uh, uh, being diagnosed with severe illness or, or progressing and dying uh, from COVID uh, through vaccination. Um, other things that you can do, mask up indoors, avoid large gatherings, um, especially uh, those that are outside of uh, your, your immediate household. Um, and of course, if you are sick or need urgent medical attention, our emergency rooms are always available to you. But as mentioned multiple times on this call, it's important that if you just are looking for testing, you utilize other testing resources. Uh, and they can be found readily at uh, ldh.la.gov slash COVID testing uh, through the 211 number, or if you're in the New Orleans area at ready.nola.gov. Nationwide, we have about 300,000 cases of Omicron every day. Uh, we have uh, 1,200 Americans who die every day from COVID. Um, and I think it's important to look at those big numbers. But what really matters is, is the number one, the number one person that matters to you. 
And that could be your, your loved one, your family, your, your child, your parent. Uh, it could be your niece uh, that's newborn uh, and can't get vaccinated. It could be your Aunt Sally, who makes the best pecan pie, um, but is fighting breast cancer and, and maybe is vaccinated, but hasn't mounted as, as robust of an immune response. Um, these are all reasons for all of us for, to step up, go above and beyond and get vaccinated. And, and it's for all of these reasons, all of these one reasons for each one of us uh, that we uh, take the steps that are necessary. And we know those, as Dr. Neil mentioned, these are, these are not unknown to us. It's, it's masking, it's getting vaccinated, it's boosting, it's socially distancing uh, during this time of, uh, of a severe surge. And so while there's a lot of numbers out there, perhaps the number that matters the most is that one, the one reason why we take these steps and, and make the necessary changes to our life. So again, thanks, thanks, uh, Governor Edwards. Thanks to all the healthcare heroes that have fought this pandemic uh, throughout, um, and thanks for everyone that's uh, that's doing their part to end this pandemic. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Edwards, for allowing uh, me to be a part of the panel to. Uh, speak to our communities about what we are experiencing at our hospitals. Uh, some of the realities that have been spoken earlier are true for here uh, in central Louisiana. Um, you know, our ER volumes are, are doubling. Uh, we're starting to see more uh, patients that are coming in with COVID. So this uh, issue of not seeing a decrease in our uh, infection rates with COVID, it seems to be on the rise as everyone has spoken to. But I like to take a different approach and kind of give a plea for our communities to help one another. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because here at our hospitals, we're here for the communities. And we're here to make sure that we have services available for those patients that will come here that have acute diseases that are, have had lifelong or life-changing events in their lives. And one of the things that we find ourselves tend to repeat ourselves of what has happened earlier this year with the Delta variant where we had many of our hospitals on diversion, where patients were coming to the ERs, were coming to the hospitals to seek care, and there was no room available to be able to take care of that loved one that was brought to the hospitals that was a part of that community. And we found ourselves trying to find different places throughout the states and other states to take them to get the care that they need. And where we find ourselves today is, is that we have an opportunity to ensure that our communities have access to care if we just follow some of the recommendations that we've all spoken about. And that is how do we mitigate the spread of COVID? Because if we continue on the trends that we are on today, even though it may not be as contagious as we think it is in the sense of hospitalizations, that does not mean that it will not get to where it would cause us to have a higher rate of hospitalizations, which in effect would cause us not to be able to offer those services because we would be on diversion and we would go back to the dark days that we had earlier this year. And it reminds me of a story. I received a call from a uh, patient, a family a member who was needing to uh, seek care, had a pacemaker, had been in defib, and then was needing some sort of general surgery. And he was in acute pain. And he came to one of our ERs, and this was in the dark days of this summer as we were going through it. He could not come to our hospital because we had no capacity, because we were full from the COVID uh, patients that we had, and we were making sure that we were taking care of them. But now we're in a different state. We have the vaccine that we can take. We have the booster that we can take. And over and over, we talk about the social distancing, being able to wash your hands, being able to wear the mask. All those things really make a difference. And so my plea is, is to our communities, Allow us to be able to help you and help your loved ones by being able to make sure that we're available and have the capacity and not get to the days that we were earlier this year where we did not have the capacity pretty much nowhere in the state of Louisiana. We were sending people out by just doing those simple things, encouraging one another to get vaccinated, wear the mask, social distancing, stay out of the large groups. And if we can do that, we can really mitigate the spread and can keep us from repeating what we experienced earlier this year. So on behalf of all of our hospitals, I know that the coworkers and the associates, that the clinical staff and our physicians, 
we thank everyone for being very supportive and governor we thank you for supporting us in this effort to be able to offer the best care we possibly can to the communities we're called to serve. Okay, at this point, I'm, and I'm, I am mindful that we've been on for about an hour and five minutes. Uh, that's indicative of how much information there was to try to relate uh, to everyone across the state. Uh, and, and so we apologize for that, um, but very important. As with that, uh, Shauna is going to determine which of you get to ask some questions and, and will let us know uh, to whom the question is directed. Yes, sir. Thank you, Governor. And our first question is going to come, come from Chris Rosado with WAFB. Chris? Hey, Governor. Good afternoon. Uh, I just wanted to ask a quick question about the COVID pills that the FDA just recently authorized. I was just wondering, what uh, availability does it look like we have here in Louisiana for that medication, and where can people find them right now? Yeah, um, well, first of all, Chris, thank you very much for the question. And, and by the way, everybody recognizes that this is an important step if we're going to take uh, the pandemic and transition to more of an endemic uh, situation with respect to COVID. You have to have antiviral pills uh, to help prevent progression of disease uh, from requiring a hospitalization or causing death. Uh, and there are two pills out there, one by Merck. Uh, that, that is believed to be about 30% effective and one by Pfizer uh, called Paxlovid that is thought to be about 70% effective. Um, and I was on a phone call with the White House on Monday and the technology involved in these antiviral pills, there's only so much you can do to speed up the process. Uh, it takes months uh, to, to, to actually manufacture these pills. They are in short supply. Uh, and, and I think Teresa may have the numbers but we actually, uh, based on the call we had this morning with our hospitals and some follow-up from the Department of Health with our medical providers again uh, later in the day, uh, we're adjusting uh, our uh, plan for how to allocate this very limited and precious resource so that it has the maximum uh, beneficial impact on our state as a whole. Uh, but what I can tell you right now is that the pills are not yet in hand, number one. Number two is when they come in, they're gonna be in very, very short supply. And the Merck pill, which is 30% effective, will be more plentiful than the Pfizer pill that is 70% effective, but it's still gonna be in short supply for some time to come. Teresa, if you'd tell them what our plan is to, to allocate those out. Sure, um, so the first allocation of Paxlovid that um, it's, that will be received by Louisiana is a total of 740. Um, for molnupiravir, which is the Merck pill, that will be 3,420. So these are, especially if you're thinking in the context of the cases that we have, this is very limited, these are very limited quantities. So what we recommend is that folks contact their healthcare provider. Your healthcare provider can help determine if you're at risk and can help direct you to um, how to get one of these, uh, a prescription that will write a prescription and, and help direct to you to get some of this medication. Um, it's not gonna be available for everybody who needs it, unfortunately. We do ex expect supply to increase and we are providing additional information to healthcare providers about where these um, medications will be distributed and so that they will know how to refer the, the patients that are most appropriate to receive them. So again, unfortunately not available for everyone who may need it, but we are, we are putting them out and distributing as soon as we get them. And um, we're providing information, updated information frequently to healthcare providers so that they have the information they need um, to direct their patients. Okay, thank you. And our next question is going to come from Taylor Toole, who is with KATC. Taylor? Hi there, thank you for taking the time to answer my questions. Um, so it's going back to the talk about, you know, the schools as we're starting school again after the new year. Um, 
I heard uh, Miss Teresa talking about outbreaks being more common during meal times and also extracurriculars. We're seeing that. Um, could you clarify, please, for me, which one uh, is more um, typical of seeing outbreaks come from the meal times or extracurriculars? And uh, how can the uh, average parent at home um, help ease their mind, so to speak? Uh, do we see us going back to a learning from home uh, type of deal? Since I know you recommended people work from home, adults, um, if they have the ability. So where do you stand on that? And are we going to see a mask mandate uh, going back across the line? Um, so I will um, answer the, the first part of your question. I think the mask mandate question may go to Governor Edwards. But keep in mind, um, we do have a public health recommendation um, in place um, to mask universally indoors across settings, including K through 12 schools. So what I what I can say to parents, and again, I'm I'm a parent with a child. I have one in eighth grade and one in fifth grade. Um, and um, if schools implement these measures, then I do believe that there can be a real reduction in risk of transmission. Um, I feel much, much more confident that even if my children get become infected because of some transmission that happens in the school setting, they are both fully vaccinated. And in the K through 12 setting, for the most part, all of these individuals are eligible for, for vaccination, five and above, right? So. I feel so much more confident than I did last year because I know even if they become infected, I, that they're going to be well protected from severe illness and, and, and hospitalization. So that brings me a lot of comfort as a parent. The other issue, one of the reasons you know, I listed all of these different um, strategies is because especially with Omicron, nothing is going to be 100% effective. This variant is going to slip through and sneak through and infect people. That's why we have to be so diligent about all of these different measures. But if, if schools, and, and I think the role of parents really can be to help make sure that they advocate with their school administrators that these measures are implemented in, their, in each individual school. Um, that they ensure that masking is in place. That is gonna be one of the most important measures. As far as your question about mealtimes go, we've had some outbreaks associated with mealtimes, definitely more that are associated with extracurricular activities. That's something else that parents can do. They can go to their school um, administrator and say, you know, we agree, we think that we shouldn't have these extracurricular activities right now. We think that they need to um, be suspended. Or you can pull your children out of extracurricular activities if they're continued, because there is a real risk. That's by far where we've seen the greatest number of outbreaks which is why we took the step to make the recommendation, even though we don't want to deprive children of that opportunity. Look, my son was in basketball camp over winter break. I pulled him out because I felt the risk was too great. And it wasn't a, wasn't a decision any of us was happy about, but unfortunately, you know, health and, and well-being and reducing this transmission and stopping the surge are, are the priorities now. Um, and as far as the one other piece about testing, you know, LDH right now offers a testing program for schools. And so that's another way to keep people safe. It's free of charge. In fact, kids get incentives if they get tested, if they so choose. Um, so if, if a parent has a child who attends a school that doesn't participate in that program, they can certainly go and say, you know, we think this is a good idea. This is going to help keep a lot of people safe. Can we you know, implement the testing program, um, the free testing program in our school. So that's another option that parents have. But I think there are a lot of ways that they can um, help contribute to increasing the safety in the school for their children. And Taylor, Taylor I, thank you for, I thank you for the question. Um, th there is not presently a mask mandate. Um, now, I will tell you, I believe that the recommendation that has been made by the Department of Health is very important. Uh, I can tell you that if you come to the governor's office, you're going to have to have a, a mask on, that my people are going to be masked there. Um, and, and so I don't take it off the table because what, what we cannot have happen uh, is that our hospitals lose the ability, the capacity to render life-saving care, and we will do a mask mandate before that happens. 
but I would ask that people not focus on whether there's a mandate in place. The recommendation is the same. We know that masks work. Um, and so especially indoors with people that you don't live with, uh, wear a mask. Um, and and it, it's just, it's so important. And quite frankly, in the grand scheme of things, the inconvenience is so minor compared to what it's like to be in a hospital struggling to get oxygen or watching a loved one struggle uh, to get oxygen uh, and know that they're sick uh, and, and, and in pain and, and, and all of the anxiety that comes with that. This is a very minor uh, request. Um, and, and so I would encourage people to focus on the recommendation. Uh, let's make this happen uh, so that we can get through this current surge. And our next question comes from Bill Decker, who's with the Morgan City Review. Bill? Bill, are you on? Bill, if you would unmute yourself. I could read this question. Yes, okay, go ahead, Governor. Okay, um, Dr. Fauci and other experts say Omicron is less severe than Delta yet Louisiana hospitalizations tripled in less than two weeks. You all are saying it's because the number of new infections is so high, and that was a question. Um, the answer to that is yes, uh, and, and I want people to understand that when, when Dr. Fauci and uh, Dr. Walensky and others give numbers, they're talking about the country as a whole. And the speed of the Omicron uh, variant in terms of transmission in cases is not uniformly the same across the whole country. Um, and so if you average all 50 states, it may be, uh, for example, that over the last week, hospitalizations have doubled. But we know it's been more than that here in Louisiana. Uh, and, and, you know, so, so we know that it's a, it's a function of the transmission. And that is true, even if it is less virulent, uh, and it's just a function of math. If, if there's 10 times as many cases, uh, and the cases are only half as, as virulent as they were before, you're still going to have more sick people. You're still going to have more people who need uh, hospitalization, um, and, and really, uh, that's bearing out right now. And, and there is a common denominator. And it's within people's ability to control this to a very large degree. The more severe the disease uh, is correlated with those individuals who are unvaccinated. The less severe is correlated with those people who are vaccinated and boosted. Uh, so there's a continuum there. And we all have a role to play. But I thank you very much, Bill, for the question. And, and I, I can let Teresa follow up it, or, or, or Dr. O'Neill, anybody that wants to talk about the whether it is more violent or not and, and whether I got the question correct. I think you did a beautiful job of answering it. Um, I, I think that that's, that's the main answer. You know, the other, the other question is we also know that more people are vaccinated now um, than previous surges. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to tease out. Is it really that this particular variant might be causing less severe disease or is it that the population as a whole is better protected? Um, but still we expect Back, we expect hospitalizations to occur, especially among those that are unvaccinated. And when you have, like Governor Edwards said, when you have the, the volume of cases that we're seeing right now, unfortunately, they're going to continue to increase. We won't see the effects for a little bit, but we're going to see increased hospitalizations continue. Okay, great. And we have two more questions. Next, we will have Erica from WWL. Erica, please unmute yourself. Go ahead. Hi, Governor Edwards. Um, my question is about large gatherings that we know are planned to happen. We know there's visitors in New Orleans for New Year's Eve and people are planning gatherings. The Sugar Bowl is Saturday, another Saints game Sunday. Are you considering any restrictions to prevent any of these large gatherings? Uh, thank you, Erica, for the question. I want to go back real quick. Just for the uh, purpose of illustrating what the math would look like, uh, I, I said, you know, even if it's half as virulent, I have no idea whether it's half or the same or more. I, that, I was doing that, so I don't want anybody uh, saying that, that I'm, I'm saying today that, that uh, the um, disease caused by uh, Omicron is not as, as virulent as the disease caused by other strains. 
uh, I, I will tell you, Erica, that I have made uh, changes to my plans uh, because a month ago I would have told you I was going to be at the Sugar Bowl and the Saints game. I will be at neither. Um, for those people who are fully vaccinated and boosted and they want to wear a mask, I, I think it can be done uh, reasonably uh, safely. It's just not some, it's not a risk that I'm willing to take. It is inconsistent with the recommendations that, that I'm getting from the, de the Department of Health uh, right now. And quite frankly, it's, it's inconsistent with my own um, uh, risk tolerance uh, right now. So I will not uh, be doing uh, either of those things. Uh, if people are going to gather uh, for New Year's Eve activities, we hope that they will do that at home, limited to their nuclear family. And if, and if it's going to be more than that, that the gatherings are at least small, that people test if possible, that they do it outside. There's a whole lot of things you can do to make your, your events uh, safer. Um, but, but we know that the more people you have, the closer together they are. Uh, and if it's indoors, that gets towards the sides of the risk uh, spectrum that, in my opinion, um, is just, it's just too high and, and, and not worth it. Uh, I don't believe you will be seeing uh, me uh, put in place any orders we're, we're, with respect to, to mandating certain things relative to that. Um, but the guidance is, is what I just gave you and what Teresa uh, went through in some detail earlier. Okay, next we'll have Shannon from BR Proud. Shannon? Hi there. I wanted to ask about testing. Uh, with the at-home antigen test, there are some concerns that it's not able to pick up Omicron, except for, except for maybe on specific days after exposure. Can one of the doctors talk about those concerns and also for the governor, are there any efforts to increase testing in the state since there is such a high demand right now? Yeah, uh, first of all, the second part is absolutely, uh, and, and we are increasing testing uh, across the state. The National Guard by itself administered something close to 4,500 tests yesterday. They've never done that many tests in one day, and that's just one piece of what we're trying to do. Um, but the testing, the increase is largely uh, right now are on the PCR side. Uh, which is the more accurate side. Uh, it's less convenient than, than purchasing an at-home test, an antigen test, a rapid test, and going home and taking it. But quite simply, the availability of those uh, is, is a very short supply. Uh, so we are increasing the testing uh, uh, that, that's going to be available uh, for people across the state. We, we do believe that the number of at-home tests that are going to be available uh, in the coming weeks and months will be uh, much uh, more plentiful uh, than, than they have been at any point uh, to date. Uh, and, and before I turn it over, and then after this question, I'll come back and close out. If someone out there is having a hard time getting a test for any reason, and they are symptomatic, they should regard themselves as COVID positive, and they, they, should, they should isolate as a result of that. Um, if y'all remember back in the early uh, days of the, of the pandemic, we didn't have testing, um, but we knew we had a lot of spread and we had a lot of sick people. And, and we were kind of sort of back to the same thing. We have a lot more testing than we have to, had been, but we didn't have this kind of cases. And so uh, until the number of tests increase and people can, can take those tests very quickly upon believing they have been exposed or developing symptoms and so forth, if you have symptoms, please, for your own sake, for the sake of your family and your community, treat yourself as, as, uh, as positive until you can uh, confirm that. Um, and, and, and look, if your symptoms remain very mild, you may never need to confirm it. Uh, but in the meantime, you shouldn't unreasonably expose others uh, to the virus. Uh, so, so with that, and with respect to specific testing uh, efforts, uh, Teresa, if you will take that question. Sure, so it does appear that antigen tests um, are less sensitive, less able to pick up a positive Omicron case than they were um, able to do among previously circulating lineages. Don't yet have data um, about any sort of um, quantitative data about the reduced mm -hmm. sensitivity, but that is what we're hearing um, both anecdotally and also from our federal partners that the antigen test is less sensitive 
um, when it comes to uh, detecting Omicron. So another reason to really um, you know, seek out PCR testing when, um, when it's available and when that is possible. Okay, so this has been a very long press conference on the day before New Year's Eve. And, and Governor, if I could interrupt just one second, we have one very last question. Taylor from KATC wants to know why are CDC quarantine guidelines changing to an easier amount of time than the previous if Omicron is so much more transmissible? That is the very last question. Yeah, so nobody on this call works for the CDC or was responsible for that. Uh, but I, I've listened to what Dr. Walensky and others have said, um, and it's a function of changing science, but also with what they believe uh, the people uh, across the country will tolerate. Uh, with respect to the science, it appears that five days is, is when most people uh, actually uh, would be transmitting uh, the, the disease or the, the virus uh, that, that, that they would be infecting others. And that's about two days before symptom onset and for two to three days afterwards. Uh, and so the five days uh, is, is about right uh, from a science perspective. Uh, they also believe that if you left it at the longer time period, uh, that, that people may decide, well, the burden just isn't worth it, that it's too inconvenient. It's going to cause too many problems at work. It's going to cause too many problems at home uh, and so forth. And then you have critical occupations. You know, we talked about, we talked about um, for example, staffing shortages exacerbating our, our challenges with respect to um, um, you know, providing care at our hospitals. Well, if people are kept out longer than necessary, then you make that worse than it has to be. And it's not just uh, in that setting, but it, it could be in other critical uh, areas, whether it's transportation or, or, or you name it. Uh, so, so the CDC has explained the change uh, as being rooted in, in uh, both science on the one hand and what uh, people will tolerate on the other. Uh, and quite frankly, if people won't tolerate the longer period, then you're actually going to be safer having the shorter period that, that more people uh, will tolerate. But we, we actually ask people to abide by all the recommendations uh, coming by, uh, whether it's from the CDC or from our own Department of Health. Uh, that's that's the best thing that we can do uh, for one another. But it, it is it is a good question, and I understand that it's not universally uh, uh, praised among even the scientific or the medical community. Uh, all, but but it is what the CDC has done. Um, and, and I will tell you just as a matter of fact, uh, I don't believe that there is a hospital that we spoke with today, and we spoke to all the big hospitals in each of our nine regions, who isn't hasn't already or isn't planning to adopt the shorter five-day period uh, so that they can get their workers back into hospital to render that life-saving care and open up more beds uh, just as soon as possible so that we can continue to, to deal with uh, the increasing demands being placed on our healthcare workers and providers. So, uh, Shauna, you had said two questions, you went with three, is there a fourth? That's it, Governor, no more questions. But, Thank all of you. This is not what any of us want to be doing on the day before uh, New Year's Eve, but it is very important uh, because you still have time out there to change your plans, uh, to make sure you're, you're doing things that, that are as safe as, as possible. Um, I'm asking you to, to please uh, be concerned, uh, be prudent, uh, be responsible. Uh, let's not be panicked. That doesn't that doesn't help, and it's not warranted, quite frankly. Um, but 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 concern is uh, very much warranted. Uh, we we go into twenty twenty two full of hope, and and I do too. I'm I'm praying for a much better year for for all of our people across the state of Louisiana. I ask you to join me in that prayer for also for the country as a whole. Um, but it's going to be a very difficult month of January. And we've been doing this in March, it'll be two full years. And I ask everybody, if you can't think of another reason to comply with, abide by the recommendations that, that we have painstakingly uh, set forth for you today, most of which are nothing new, they're just a re urging of things that we've known for a long time. But if you can't think of any other reason to do it, think about our exhausted healthcare workers 
who've been, whether they're doctors or nurses or paramedics or, or respiratory therapists, whoever they are, um, they've been at this an awful long time. Uh, and I know how dispiriting it can be when they see that, that we're not doing as well as we should be 12 and a half months after we started vaccinating people. Uh, so let's, let's do what we can, please, uh, for ourselves and, and our families and for our healthcare workers and for everybody else. Most important among these is getting vaccinated, get boosted when you're eligible, uh, and then, and then uh, especially while we are surging as we are, following all these other mitigation uh, recommendations. So with that, thank you all very much for continuing to cover this. I do look forward to a much better 2022. I hope we can turn the page on the Omicron surge just as soon as possible and in the best possible condition, but largely that's up to all of us. Um, and, and so uh, your, your help is very much uh, wanted and, and also your prayers. Thank you and God bless. Thank you, Governor. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, this has been recorded. If you need it, contact our office.